Welcome to the Book Editor Show number 36, Editing the Short Story. I'm Clark Chamberlain, and there was a time when writers were afraid to walk the streets of London, fear of writing a faux pas, or worse, letting the participles dangle in the street. Of course, that all changed when he came to town, London's Lord of the Letters. He's my friend and co-host, Peter Turley. Peter, how are you doing today? <laughs> Lord of the Letters. I might have to get that on a, on a plaque somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm excellent. How are you doing, Clark? I'm doing pretty well today, you know, uh, a lot of great stuff's been going on, um, I just keep waiting for the other shoe to fall type of thing, you know, I'm like, things are just going too well. <laughs> um, I need, before we go any further, I need to address the, the blank space behind you. Uh, yes, so it's all black <laughs> now, and um, I just finished this this morning, um, building a brand new studio here so we can do uh, audio recording for uh, for. Uh, for books, and then also doing more educational videos here, and uh, I've been doing a remodel of my office slash garage, which is now becoming totally my office. I actually took the garage door out, boarded it up, making space for a new employee that's going to start uh, next month, and I'm uh, just excited, just excited about everything that's happening. So Excellent. It's um, it's a very professional look. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I kind of miss the posters, so I don't know. I'm yeah. gonna have to decide on that one. Yeah, I have to kind of like focus on your face now. So, <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. There's nothing else to look at. So, how about uh, how about you? How are the studies going? Really good. Yeah, enjoying it. It's kind of like working well um, with the writing. Um, I've kind of like that's that's out my hands for a bit now. I've like sent that away and it's having some editing done to it. So I'm. Hopefully, going to get that turned around as quick as possible. Um, right. But it's good, enjoying it. Yeah, um, good. learning in the day and writing on the night, and it's all kind of coming together nicely. And spending my days just how I like them. <laughs> so, so now, have you yet uh, gotten up in class and raised your hand and said, "Now, um, Peter Turley on the Book Editor Show says"? <laughs> Reference myself. <laughs> Reference yourself. <laughs> yeah. Hasn't happened yet. <laughs> no, I don't, don't think I get quite as many marks for uh, referencing myself. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. <laughs> you should try it sometime. So yeah, maybe, maybe it would go down with more authority now that I can say Lord of the Letters. The Lord of the Letters. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> well, um, I do want to give a shout out real quick to uh, John Paul. He messaged me a couple weeks ago. He's one of the students uh, from my Punch Him in the Gut class, and uh, about writing emotional fiction. And uh, he wanted to know more about writing short stories, and uh, you know, I thought that what a what a perfect idea for a show. But we had to get the perfect guest. I want to introduce uh, Gregory L. Norris. Uh, he has written for national magazines and fiction anthologies, and has penned novels, the occasional episode for television, and recently was hired to write his first feature film, Brutal Colors, due to be released soon by Royal Blue Pictures. His short stories have won the Spine Tinglers Award the Small Press Writers and Artists Association Award for Year's Best New Writer, and he has thrice uh, notched honorable mentions in Dellen Datlow's Best Horror Year, uh, um, Best Horror of the Year books. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Gregory when he submitted his uh, his writing Third World to a Bleak New World anthology. Um, not only is he an amazing writer, uh, he's just a fantastic individual, wonderful friend. Uh, our friendship's grown over this last year. I'm just I'm just thrilled to be able to call him friend. Uh, Gregory, how are you doing today? Well, I'm doing wonderful, and especially after that very gracious introduction. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So, now you have been uh, professionally writing for how many years now? 25 years, I think I just, uh, you know, half of my life. Wow. I, I just hit the big 5 on Spaceship Earth and, you know, was thinking back to the first professional sale I had and it was 25 years ago. Oh, that's a really time. a cool thing. <laughs> what, <laughs> what, was your, what was your first one? My first one was a, a publication of a short story um, in the magazine, the national magazine, The Drummer, I sent the story in and totally spaced that I had submitted it because so long passed between submission and hearing back. A year later, I received an acceptance letter and a paycheck in the mail, and they said, we went to reject this story so many times and we just could not do it. So we have reluctantly accepted it. It's been <laughs> Well, you know, a reluctant acceptance is an acceptance nonetheless. So I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> no, that's really great. Um, and like I said, I really do enjoy your work. It's uh, oh, fantastic. It grabs the reader quickly, and um, 
you do a lot of these anthologies. I, you know, when I was taking a look at your bio and uh, the information you sent me, you do a ton of these anthologies. You're always posting them on Facebook. Um, is that the main section of work that you're doing right now? Well, I do a little bit of everything. I, I'm, I'm one of those writers who's either cursed or blessed with a, an incredibly fertile imagination. I don't have a great deal of um, finesse when it comes to judging at the start one story idea over another. This one will be better than that one. This one is worth my time over that one. It really is a curse. I, I so love the idea of, of writing, and I so enjoy the process of writing. To me, it is the heart within my heart. So that, you know, a story that, you know, may not be um, the most beautiful of children ends up inspiring me as much as something that goes out and wins an award. Um, so I just, I write everything. I judge it once it's done. Um, but when I've created an idea, I tend to write the idea. So I'm working in, you know, novels, short stories, screenplays, teleplays. You know, I have different offers, and I tend to follow up on those offers. And as soon as I can clone myself enough times to do all the work, <laughs> it'll all get done. <laughs> I, I feel you on that one. There is not enough hours in the day. <laughs> I mean, I'm old now. I'm officially old, but I still, you know, am writing with the same speed that I wrote when I was a teenager. Uh -huh. uh, well, actually, you know, do you, do you find that it, uh, it's easier? I mean, 25 years later, to, to write at a professional level that gets acceptance, acceptance, acceptance. Um, I don't know that it's easier. I, I guess I just feel more secure and, and comfortable in my own skin, and I have a tendency to get out of my way now more than I did when I was, say, 15 or 25 or even, you know, in my 30s. Um, I, I approach it every day with the same love. And so I do write in, you know, across a wide variety of genres. I'm not focused on just one. Um, I haven't pigeonholed myself, and I hope that makes me not a one-note you know, that I'm able to write one day, you know, a, a killer science fiction story and the next day an incredibly romantic story and then a murder mystery or, you know, or, or a Halloween fantasy. I, I love it all. There, there's no genre that I don't love. Yeah. Well, I, love the, um, I, love, I love the thing you said there about getting out of your own way. I think that's, um, that's something we all kind of, like, fight with a lot at the beginning and I think <laughs> it's one of the most important sort of things to be able to learn how to do especially in order to become uh, like as prolific as yourself and you sure. know now that you can just sort of say you know I just write everything <laughs> you know, whatever pops up I'm just gonna write it and you know that's a skill in itself well sure I mean there was a time in my youth you know when I would do anything including the dishes before I would sit down to write you know that that whole psyching yourself up to plant your thiso as my Lebanese grandmother would say in the chair and just do the work and now I don't have to, to do that I just come in here with my cup of coffee and can travel as far away as the Delta Quadrant or Moonbase Alpha or wherever, my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like that. So I like that a lot. Well, let's, uh, let's dive into some of these ideas of, on how we can tap into your expertise on uh, editing a great short story and putting together something you know that really hooks a reader in right away um, and also an editor so that they'll actually accept the submission. Um, now it sounds like you know that you start off, uh, you, you write it all out. Um, what's your what's your process of getting through the editing and trying to make this the best work possible? Well, I think that's such a great question, and it's so important. I am really lucky to belong to a fantastic writers group that I founded up here in the Arctic Circle. Um, <laughs> I live in northern New Hampshire. You know, it's the second coldest place on the planet in February after Antarctica, and I'm not kidding you there. Um, but what this, this region lacks in economy, it excels at in creativity. There are more writers per capita up here, and some of them are just fantastic. So what has really helped me is the feedback that I get on my, my writing from my writers group. I'll read it aloud. I'll get feedback from them. They'll pick up on you know, the places where I wanted them to be um, upset or terrified or inspired or you know, to laugh. And that feedback is invaluable. What I started doing long before I joined the writers group was I generally do about five drafts of a story. There's the longhand draft, which to me is the hardest and the most enjoyable, and then there are the subsequent ones done on the computer where I edit. The very last edit that I do is I read it out loud to myself, and anything that jags on the ear, I generally can catch it and, and fix that jag. And I, I don't gloss over my edits. I'm really vicious 
to myself when it comes to that final out loud cleaning edit. Um, so if I've, I've reached a part where the words are a jumble and they're not clear or they're not as poetic as I want them to be or whatever, is I will not move on until I have fixed that part of the story. So I think an, an out loud edit where you read it aloud with the door shut um, in the privacy of your writing space to catch anything that might be redundant, words used too close together in the same paragraph. Um, I had an editor who once said his recommendation was don't use the same specific word, you know, not the banal words like the and 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 but, but something that's really specific. If you can help it within the, you know, the same three paragraphs. Mm -hmm. That to me has been really invaluable. I'm, I'm really hard on my own, you know, creativity when it comes to that final edit. And I'm happy because once that's done, the story is ready to go. Um, so I find that that helps, you know, having, having feedback from other writers whose talent I trust and admire and then having my own, you know, final run through where I can just massage the story into perfect shape to get it out the door. I don't trust um, that when I hit send, even if it's to an editor that I've worked with a million times, that the editor is there to clean up my story. I want it clean enough to eat off of. And many, many times I've had editors say, my God, this thing came in more professional than the big name best-selling author in the anthology. Um, and have been, you know, referred to as a clean enough to eat off of copy. Um, so I find that, that that really is is my, you know, I guess my, my permission slip before I hit send. So that's, that is actually fantastic. You know? <laughs> um, the, the reading out loud is so important. Um, and I also have to say, because when I, because I'm, I'm not a fantastic line editor. I don't do my own line edit work. It's something that I'm not um, a fan of doing, you know, and trying to dig in and make sure. And um, so I always send it out. So let's, you know, for instance, our anthology that uh, you're a part of uh, with Oblique New World, you're right. Like getting that back from my line editor and having to go through and see where she was making corrections on other people's work and then I come to your story and there's like one thing. There's one thing in there. And I'm like, wow. You know, that's, well, thank you. that's just, <laughs> that's a, that I makes love a big book, difference. by the way. I love that book. Well, thank you. So it, uh, I'm excited to get that one out. Um, it certainly has been too long <laughs> in coming out, but, uh, but it's good to, it's almost finished and ready. So, um, I like the, um, I like the cleaning off to, uh, to eat off <laughs> saying, sure. um, and I think that that's, that's certainly perhaps even more so applicable to short stories because it has to be so tight. You know, like, you, we obviously, it's hard to define what a short story is, but obviously uh, the word count is, is a big one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you yeah. know, having that, that ruthless approach uh, when you're making that final pass is, can only serve you well, really, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the short story is now being defined around 7,500 words, but novella starts at 10,000, so in theory you could go up to 9,999, but you want all of those words to be specific and they all need to matter. You know, there shouldn't be any wasted ones. Yeah, yeah. And, and also what you, what you said about kind of um, not repeating the same specific word every three paragraphs, was it? Mm -hmm. um, just does so much for, for keeping the reader engaged, you know, I mean, we, we forget how much we you know, we're, we're like pattern finding machines, and if if we as a reader see sort of like the same word popping up, you know, and as you say in three paragraphs, it's pr it's probably going to flag to your attention, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But um, well, that, that that is a that that's a really sort of ruthless. <laughs> say every three yeah. paragraphs, you know, that's a, that can be hard. You know, when I was invited to come on this show, which I you know I really enjoyed since discovering it was thinking about, you know, my favorite short stories, and one of them is um, Edgar Allan Poe's Murders in the Rue Morgue, the first murder mystery. I mean, the man created his own genre. And I recently reread that over the weekend, and as elegant and beautiful as his language is, it's very well metered out. There is no redundancy. It's just, it's a masterpiece. And so, you know, with, with that as, as a starting point, I mean, we should all aspire as writers to want our prose to be that clean and that engaging and that elegant. Well, yeah, absolutely, you know, and especially um, for writers, and I, 
I think the majority of writers who listen to this show are those who are trying to pursue this as a professional occupation. And if you're getting into the short story game, the anthology game, and putting this stuff out, you know, when when it comes across the desk, so like uh, we had uh, just under 200 submissions um, on the last uh, anthology we were putting together. And so when you're reading that many, you've got to find the right one fast that really stands out amongst the rest of the crowd. And you know those ones that are well edited are the ones that speak to you. Absolutely. And if you think about, you know, other anthologies getting, you know, in advance of 2,000 submissions, imagine, you know, the, the amount of time that it would take to go through all of those and to, you know, to find the gems among, you know, the ones that aren't going to make it. So, you know, I really think it does help a writer to think in that, that mindset. Make it clean enough to eat off of. Don't expect an editor to, to, to fiercely edit um, a submission that you yourself haven't taken the time and effort to put into, you know, your, your part of it, your voice. And to have it, you know, have it sing, have it, you know, be impossible to be rejected. Yeah, um, because when you're doing it that way, when you're putting that much effort into it, yes, those pieces shine, and it's really easy to 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 look at too. And you're like, this one here, you know, I mean, it, yeah, it might have a couple good ideas in it, but they just spent no time trying to make it really shine. You know, and um, as a publisher, that's something, you know, you're immediately like, well, I don't want to have to work on on all this extra work, you know, to make that what it would need to be to be included in this anthology. Sure. And editors really do appreciate it when you put in the effort to make it absolutely clean enough to eat off of. I, I So I've had that said to me so many times, and I think that's really good, you know, good practice mm -hmm. to put into, you know, Let's talk about uh, about the hook and the importance of being able to grab the attention of the reader early on and to hold them through that short story. Well, I was thinking when, when we were discussing my coming on the show, um, I was thinking about a story that I recently sold to a murder mystery crime anthology um, that's debuting in February at the big journalists, crime writing, you know, the, the crime journalists convention in Boston. Um, this coming February. It's called Murder in the New England Newsroom. And like you, this editor was deluged with submissions, far more than, than could be in one anthology of 16 maybe stories. My opening line for that, the hook that got him in, was the opening sentence, which was, stare out the same window long enough and you're destined to see something. And after that, the story just went right into the murder mystery the secrets. It's, the story's called Exhuming Secrets on a Hot August Day. And the editor who got deluged came back and said, from the moment I read that opening sentence, I knew you were going to send me on a thrill ride. And apparently I didn't disappoint because it's one of 16 stories coming out in this anthology. One of the things that, that I, I really strive to do with my writing, whether it's short stories or, or longer versions, is to not have any dead space not have any slow space, not have any downtime, um, unless it's intentional. There was a time a couple of years ago I was writing a novel where my characters were all standing around posturing. And I realized that after a page of them posturing and staring off into space and dreaming about jolly old England, it was time to drop a chandelier on their heads and get them moving. One of the things that I try to do is to keep the story constantly in motion. So from the moment the guy is staring out the window and he sees what he sees, the mystery kicks off and it never stops and it never slows down. Um, one of the, re the responses I got from the editor was that, you know, you had me so completely hooked on this story. It was, you know, the, the pages were turning, um, you know, and, and the atmosphere was like the classic southern gothic writers. And I'm up here in the north, so I thought that was kind of a neat, you know, neat little sidebar. But the story at 6,700 words, when I, you know, fiercely edited that story back in June for submission, um, I made sure that there were no dead spots. There were no, you know, places where a reader was going to be bored. And if I was bored by anything that happened in the story, I could pretty much gather that the reader was going to be bored and either flip pages or move on, and I didn't want that. 
Um, so I started in the thick of the inciting incident, which starts the action, and I just kept it moving. Whether it was the emotion was moving or, you know, the kinetic energy of the mystery itself was moving, I just made sure that there were no dead points. And if there were dead points, they got edited out. If they were not necessary, they went. And I think that's, you know, if, if you can start with a great killer first sentence and then, you know, live up to it with every sentence between that and the end, um, you're going to sell your story. You're going to hook your reader. You're going to hook your editor. And people are going to go looking for other work by you. So, so yeah, I think that's, you know, that, that's a good practice, you know, that I've both preached and lived. I think that's a, that's an awesome takeaway. I think um, that's something that is quite applicable, like in the, the difference between short stories and novels. I think, you know, uh, in regard to structure with a, a novel, you might say be working towards a three-act structure and the, the inciting incident may be 10, 20% into the book. Mm -hmm. And so maybe with the short story, you know, starting as close to that inciting incident as possible mm -hmm. um, is a great way to grab engagement right at the beginning. Um, you know, you, we don't really have the, the time to sort of, you know, build up this big, you know, start as late as possible. Would you say that that would be your advice? Um, well, yes. As a matter of fact, what I was thinking about when, you know, running through the whole notion of the short story is the definition of a story is beginning, middle, and end. Your beginning... I believe in most cases should not be, um, you know, saddled with adipose tissue. In other words, I've read stuff where the opening is a jumble of backstory. Backstory should be folded in, you know, like the ingredients into, you know, into a cake. They should be folded in seamlessly throughout and not just lumped at the very beginning. Um, I like to begin in the thick of the action. You know, whatever it is that starts the story moving and keeps it moving. Your ending obviously should end, you know, with an incredibly satisfying conclusion. But I think it's also very important that the middle not be weighted down and um, dismissed as just connective tissue. Something has to happen between that wonderful opening in media res and the conclusion where you just really deliver, you know, the reason for having read this 10-page or 20-page story. So I think it's also important not to just let the middle sag. You know, I think it's important to keep the story moving. Um, I'm a real fan of editing out anything that's flabby and just having it just be incredibly streamlined. And, and how I've managed to do that, like I said, is by doing five drafts of a story um, and the last one being an out loud read where it is, you know, if this just doesn't make sense, it's got to go or it gets edited. You know, um, just like what you're saying there, um, um, sorry, I'm getting sorry, something I'm back. Sorry. Someone took it. Okay. <laughs> um, so what you were saying there, though, I, I really, uh, I really feel like that. You know, like uh, three years ago, I was in a class and was doing a short story, and I made that mistake. You know, I had I had submitted it to because it was a writers group, you know, where we would put our work out there. And, and um, I made that mistake, you know, like I found that the story, I was putting too much information at the beginning of the story, and the story really was starting like the, the 600, 700 words in. So mm -hmm. how, does, how would you suggest, you know, when a, a writer sits down and they put together this work, that they can really identify the start of the inciting incident there, and they're not feeling like, all this information that they've got beforehand, you know, that they can actually cut that out, you know, that they can or move it in and put it around somewhere else in the story. Sure. Well, I think it's absolutely imperative to be well read. I read every day. I, I have, you know, books in the downstairs that are the downstairs books, and I have books in the upstairs that are the upstairs books. Um, and I read a lot of short stories, and I read a lot of novels, and I read a lot of writing magazines. And I think, you know, being well-read is a great way to see how other people are doing their work and to get a sense of what's out there in publishing, um, you know, whether, whether it's, you know, for the glimpse into what others are doing or, you know, just to be a better writer yourself by reading other people's writing, reading good writing, reading bad writing, too. Um, as far as that goes, I really believe you sit down and you start at the beginning 
and you don't go back to edit until you have a draft. I really like to get to the end and then I can judge the story whether or not it works, whether it's a story that I want to send out into the world, um, whether it's a story that should go out into the world. Oftentimes I've written stories just for myself and they're in those filing cabinets behind me right now and have never seen the light of day, but I wrote them because I loved them. I think once you have the draft, then it's really important to judge the draft, to sit down and to see what you have to work with. And if that opening paragraph doesn't suck you in, then maybe you work on that. And then, then cut or add and, and to make it so that what you have in you know 75% first draft is 85% in second draft and is 99.99% by the time you hit send. Um, the other day, I had the, the distinct joy of spending an entire Sunday with one of my favorite friends and writers who is also a publisher. And I listened to um, several of his novel chapters. And at the very beginning of one of them was this line. Um, the quote was, many lights in all colors. Now, he comes to me for editorial advice as well as camaraderie. And so I edited that into a kaleidoscope of colored lights which I thought read better than many lights in all colors. And he liked that and he made that change and I thought that was that little bit of poetry that did away with some words but made the image, which was these computer servers, dozens of them, it made that image sing. And it's such a fantastic story, he's gonna sell this. Um, but that's what I would do with my own writing, is if you know, in the haste of the first draft I wrote down many lights in all colors. By the time I was hopefully in the second draft, I would have changed it to a kaleidoscope of colored lights. Something that was a little more poetic, a little more distinct, you know, using um, the exact wording as opposed to a generalization. You know, so that's, you know, when I sit down to edit, I cut and I tighten and I sometimes add um, and hopefully by, you know, by the end I have turned the story into something unique and publishable. Mm -hmm. Now, with five drafts, and you were talking about going to your writers group and you're getting good feedback from there, what point do you take that story in these drafts and share it with the writers group or with trying to get feedback from readers? Oh, I'll, I share it in the first draft, the longhand draft, longhand draft at, right at the beginning. I, I have no fear. Um, when I'm writing the story, you know, I'm writing it the first time for me and for love. And I will share it. Tonight I'm sharing, you know, longhand chapter from a novel that I've written. Um, and I can't wait to hear it. You know, I, I really, that out loud read, you know, when it's actually voiced into the world, it becomes something else. It becomes alive. And you're able to see where it may need, you know, a little bit of plastic surgery here and there. Um, that's not necessarily something everybody should do. But if you're in a group where you trust the readership around you, why not? Why not? Yeah. You know, I've got a pretty thick hide and I'm able to take criticism really decently. Um, on that point, one of the things that I, I always do is when I send out a story into the universe to a publisher, my automatic thought, my mindset is that the story will be rejected. Um, and I've had that, I've maintained that, you know, gestalt since day one. Happily, many, many times it is not rejected and it's accepted, but that's what I've sort of sold myself on is anything you send out there is going to be rejected. And once you agree with that, you know, it, the pain is over. Um, so as far as reading out loud to people that you trust, absolutely. I read first drafts all the time. I get a little scared. <laughs> <laughs> I always get a little nervous about reading stuff until I've gone through it a couple of times. So good on you that uh, you're brave enough to do that. <laughs> well, I don't know if it's bravery. It might be stupidity. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm fairly fearless, though. I worked for Paramount. After that, nothing. You know, nothing compares. There is the. There is no better way, though, to. Um... You know, because obviously we can fall in love with our own work <laughs> to it. And if you're you're having to sort of, you know. Um, cut away the first few chapters so that you can start as late as possible and you can, you know, I think uh, William Trevor called it the art of the glimpse and, you know, we, we want it to be the most exciting glimpse <laughs> possible and I think that reading it out loud and getting people's feedback is useful and as difficult as it may be, 
you know, when someone maybe says, well, you can maybe do away with that first paragraph. <laughs> you know, sometimes it can only be someone else that, that says that. <laughs> True. And again, you know, you judge the feedback and you agree with what you agree with and then, you know, you reject what you don't agree with. I mean, it is your baby after all. Yeah. But, you know, and talking, that, that uh, totally is a perfect segue into um, one other thing we wanted to talk about for sure, and that's the heart of the story. You know, like that, that idea that, that someone might not see it like you do and wants to remove the heart and wants to remove that or like trying to get to that heart of the story and understand what it is so that you can really let other people know, hey, this is what the story is about and this is where you're going to dive in and, and really sink your teeth into this. Well, there are so many ways to tell, you know, the story. And it's up to the writer to tell it in their own unique way. I have my own unique voice, as do you and as do you too, Peter. And if we were all to say, you know, write a Halloween story about a jack-o'-lantern, we'd turn in three completely different stories, maybe in three different genres. Um, yesterday, I ran through story galleys of a short story that I've sold. And the editor, we... I love this editor, but it's the first time we've worked together, and he really sort of butchered out my voice. And so I went back and I replaced my voice um, into these galleys. Um, and I, that's the danger one runs, I guess, in anything, in any, you know, in any creative venture, is that they're just not going to get, you know, my point of view. They're not going to get my my thing across. But I have to say that hasn't happened often. Um, you know, generally I turn in a story. I've, I've told the story the best way that I can. Um, sometimes they'll come back and want to rewrite and want something changed. And, you know, and if I agree with it and I, I think it benefits the story, sure, I'll do it. If it removes, you know, Gregory L. Norris from the equation, then it's not my story anymore. Yeah. Um, you know, which is one of the reasons why I don't live in Hollywood. Everything is done by committee out there. I mean, I, I was in Hollywood for the longest time, you know, very happily now right from, you know, I'm looking out at Mount Washington from my office window as we speak, where I'm able to do what I want to do the way that I want to do it and then put it out into the world and, you know, and, and hopefully have an editor or a publisher or a producer, um, you know, come along for the journey and enjoy it the way that I presented it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I think, you know, as writers, we all, you know, have to strike the perfect balance between humility and ego, and um, find that, that middle ground where we are completely at ease defending our choices in writing. You know, this is the way I did it, and this is the way it should have been done. And, you know, and if you do it enough times, you do, like anything, the practice is going to, you know, really benefit um, you when you sit down with your pen or your fingertips to the keyboard, and, you know, and, and you'll know that for Clark's jack-o'-lantern story, this was the right way to go with that story. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a contagious kind of uh, faith <laughs> talking to you. I think that's, uh, that's a really great oh, thing. And, you know, having that, that faith in yourself and saying, you know, this is, this is my message, this is my, my writing, and, you know, I, I have to do this, and I have to, it has to be out there. And, you know, take it or leave it. <laughs> I think that's, uh, you know, that's inspiring, and that's a great attitude. Well, like I said, I'm always open to editing suggestions and, and have done many, many, many over the course of the last 25 years. But I write stories that people, you know, seem to like to read and editors love to buy and they're always coming to me for more. And, you know, and, and it's what you do as a writer is writers must write. And I love to write. And hopefully, you know, we'll continue to be able to do this for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope so too, because uh, you're just a uh, <clears throat> just really fantastic. You know, being able to get out there and uh, quite an inspiration. I've always enjoyed our emails back and forth. I know I've I've uh, run into some problems this last year, and the encouragement that I get from you is just fantastic. So I well, appreciate that. Well, you know, that. Clark, you're the legitimate article. You should be writing, <laughs> and you too, Peter. Well, uh, Peter, do you have any other uh, final thoughts, questions for Gregory? Um, no, I think that was a that that was really interesting. I think I like um, you know the 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 ruthless economy of words, and I think I know we were talking sort of off off air about uh, a friend of yours um, that's that's just had to to cut 
yeah. of many words out of, <laughs> out of a story. I think it's 4,500 words or more out of her out of her novel. <laughs> <laughs> I think so, uh, yes, having the uh, having the courage and determination to do that is a. Uh, is what we should all work towards because I think that that's, you know, as we, we say all, all the time on the show, you know, good writing is good editing. And I think, you know, driving that, we've, we've driven that home today. And I think that that's, um, you know, whenever we say it, it kind of like, it reminds me even more <laughs> just how important the these multiple drafts, you know, are to, to the final product. Yeah, they really are. So, uh, Gregory, do you want to add anything before we close it up for today? Just, you know, thank you for this wonderful opportunity. It's always a pleasure to be, um, you know, able to speak about writing and publication. And, you know, you guys do a fantastic job, and this was an absolute delight to be part of. Well, thank you so thank much. You. Um, where's the best place uh, for people to find your work? Oh, anywhere. Just plug me into, you know, to Google, and you'll find a, a zillion links. Um, my, my little blog, which is uh, www.gregoryalnorris.blogspot.com, very simple um, but upbeat blog and it's gotten a huge amount of traffic and I generally you know do release news there um, but you know Amazon Barnes and Noble I'm easy to find I'm easy oh, to find God. I can't hide <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good way to be and I hope, uh, hope oh I think the Cylons got Clark again yeah I lost him momentarily <laughs> We've uh, we've edited him out of the show. <laughs> well, yeah, no, we've uh, we've lost you lost you just there, Clark, at the end. <laughs>